Um, this Care Compass project is provided and sponsored by Brookdale of Bowling Green, Ohio Living, Golden Care Partners, Optimal Aging Institute, and the Wood County Hospital, as well as the Wood County Committee on Aging. So we thank all of you for joining us today. We especially thank Brookdale for providing the lunches that you may have received. And um, we will begin our featured speaker today. Uh, we have um, our first topic is home care versus placement. And we're very fortunate to have on the call today, Beth Bolt, a licensed social worker and Catherine Clark, um, marketer representative from Brookdale of Bowling Green. So I'm gonna turn it over to Beth um, to share their information. Hi, good morning, everybody. How are you today? Uh, I um, When I signed up to speak about this, it was prior to the virus. And um, I've been a social worker since 1998. And uh, never has there been such a time in my career when um, home care and caregiving has, has just come to the forefront so much. Um, I think part of that is because of the COVID. I've actually had two clients bring a loved one home who was in long-term care, and we sat down and developed plans on, on what that would look like and what to do, you know, if there was an emergency or something like that. Um, Besides being a social worker and supporting individuals with making plans for their aging loved ones, uh, I help, um, I, I'm a daughter <laughs> and I am caregiving for my mother-in-law who's now placed and my father-in-law who recently had a stroke. So I, I feel your, um, you know, your, your caregiving journey, both professionally and personally. So I hope that qualifies me to talk to you a bit about, Katie and I want to share uh, information about home care versus placement, some of the considerations, um, maybe a little bit about cost. And then also, I think my focus is more on caregiver considerations because you are the folks who are doing the work. Um, making the plans and implementing what your loved one needs. Um, I can't emphasize enough how much support I needed during that process. And I hope you all know there is support out here. I'm so glad to see more people joining our group. Um, my mother-in-law uh, got dementia and at first it was very mild. It was a non-issue. Um, she wanted to stay home as long as possible. So my nephew moved up from Florida and we put caregiving things in place. My husband took over the finances and, you know, we, we got on with all that. But then it came to a point where one of us was going to have to not work to continue being family caregivers. And as a family, we couldn't make that decision. And at that point with the dementia, Katie really didn't want uh, caregivers in the home. So we decided to place her. Katie, Katie from Brookdale will talk more about that. Um, I wanted to kind of get into some of the considerations we need to look at as caregivers when we're caregiving in the community. You know, we need to be able to maintain that individual's health. That's a big, huge chunk right there. We have to look at their medical needs, medications, and, and what possibly, you know, doctor's appointments, uh, who's going to cover those. Um, a lot of caregivers have other family members involved, some don't. Um, Mobility is a big issue. Is the home the individual's living in, it, are they able to get around? Are they able to access the bathtub uh, safely? Things like that. Um, are there stairs? Do things need to be altered or monitored? Where does the money come from for those alterations and, and, and uh, monitoring? I don't know if it, everyone knows long-term care and, and adaptations like that aren't necessarily covered by insurance. So uh, this is coming out of the caregiver or the family member's pocket. Um, a big thing, and I know Katie's gonna uh, go hard on this one, so I won't, is when you're caregiving, how are you taking care of your loved one's emotional health? 
Um, you know, what opportunities for socialization do they have? Um, how do we avoid isolation for both the individual and the caregiver? Um, we're blessed in this community to have a lot of good options for daytime activities uh, when things aren't COVID, of course. Um, that's a big consideration. Another thing we have to consider, if our loved one is, is fairly mobile, fairly healthy, uh, you know, how is their cognition? How is their memory? Uh, are they going, are they, are they getting to a point where they might wander? What do we need to do to ensure their safety in the home? Um, you know, we all know caregiving can include bathing, toileting, maybe even feeding an individual, moving them physically or, or, uh, you know, even guiding them. Um, if it's a, more of a cognitive issue. Caregivers usually end up taking over banking, shopping, and housekeeping, the things I call uh, instrumental activities of daily living. Um, and then also, we can never forget about nutrition. Seniors uh, have a rough time with that, our taste buds change, all those things kind of add up. And then along with mobility, of course, is home safety. Is, your, is the bath uh, able to be accommodated? Again, the steps, are there lighted pathways at night? Um, do we have a bed mattress with a, an alarm in case mom or dad gets up during the night? And, and you know, uh, there's all kinds of technologies out there coming to make caregiving at home e you know, easier, like alarm systems like um, I, uh, Sundial, it's a uh, like a little box mom and dad can talk into and all the kids can arrange their schedule and make sure everything's followed up on uh, through a phone app. So caregiving in the home is, is, there's a lot of support out there to do it. But I think if you're not going to hire home care help, you really need to look um, at, care, at caring for yourself too. Home care help. There's all kinds of agencies out there. They do all different kinds of things and they're all can be funded by different uh, sources. You know, if you come home from the hospital with, with a, a Medicare home care company for medical needs and therapy needs, you know, that's usually covered. But after that, if you're a caregiver and you want to bring in some care, um, you're going to likely be private paying. Um, there's a veteran's benefit you might be able to access if your loved one's a veteran, but you'll likely be private paying $20 to $25 an hour for an agency. Agencies are nice because they're bonded, licensed, insured. You have a peace of mind that way. Um, you might not always get the same caregiver. That can be very confusing to somebody who has dementia. It can also be a bit demoralizing to your loved one, um, especially for tasks like bathing. Um, I'd rather have a familiar person, I believe, bathe me than, than a, a different staff person frequently. Um, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I need my notes here. Uh, Non-medical home care can include personal care assistance for those activities of daily living like bathing. They even can do light homemaking, housekeeping, meal prep, and things like that. They can run errands, do grocery shopping, um, and things like that. And also they would provide some companionship. I've had clients hire a home care aide to simply come in and read a story, um, talk about current events, um, do things outside the box, maybe not even worry about hygiene, but um, work on puzzle books and brain stimulating activities and things like that. The possibilities of, of how you would work with the care agency on, on getting the things your loved one specifically needs are endless for you um, in that arena. Like I said, these are all private pay. 
Um, some families choose to use their family members. I don't know about you, but when we were working to keep Katie at home, I had many promises that there'd be lots of help from family members. Unfortunately, that, that didn't really come to fruition. Um, but I also have families I work with who have private or uh, a nice lady from the church caregiver, um, you know, someone you trust wholeheartedly. And uh, th that rate usually runs about 13 to $18 an hour, somewhere in there. So that's another option for home caregiving. Um, and that then you can generally discuss schedule and, and needs directly with that person. A lot of times when you go through an agency for the care, you're talking to a coordinator. You don't get to decide individual things with the provider who comes in. They're basically given the care plan that you developed with the, with the um, agency and they implement that. Any changes then would need to be made with the agency. That can be uh, a bit confusing because, well, I told that aid, well, that aid didn't have any way to communicate it with another aid. They go through a centralized system. So that's one consideration too with hiring home care versus an agency home care versus a friend you can just call on the fly um, and discuss concerns as they arise and things like that. I've had people make some pretty neat modifications to their home. One of my clients just put in a $20,000 Kohler, well, with the remodel and the bath, a, a sit down, door open, walk in bathtub. I, I think it's just wonderful and her mother's enjoying it. It's in the mother-in-law's suite and the family's going to be using that um, down the road as they age. So, uh, Some of the, the pros to choosing home care as opposed to facility care, which Katie Clark will talk about next, is you know your family member best. You know their likes, dislikes, preferences. Um, you know, I even knew uh, my mother-in-law's temperature preferences, you know, just exactly where she was happiest sitting in the house you know, because the air conditioner or the heater or whatever, <laughs> it changed seasonally. <laughs> um, so you know them best. And so that's a hard thing to let go of if you're considering care. Um, your loved one in the home, whether it be their home or your home, you know, they're going to feel more independent living in a home. Um, than they would than they do in the nursing home. Um, I I've seen that with my mother-in-law and now with my father. Um, home is just comfortable and familiar. Um, there's transition periods, but home is home. Cost the cost of home care can be much less than facility care, especially if it's intermittent. Now, if you're going to have to bring somebody in 24 hours a day, your nursing home costs are definitely uh, uh, less expensive. They would be probably half the cost of 24-7 in-home care provided by a provider. That can be done, but it's, it's like $400 a day if uh, a provider's doing it. Um, some of us also uh, choose to care given the home because we made a promise. Uh, promise to our loved one that we wouldn't put them in a home, that we'd do everything we could to, to maintain them where they're at. Um, and then I don't know about you guys, but I, I just felt a guilt. Like, even though we didn't plan to become caregivers, I felt guilty that I needed to place my mom, um, mother-in-law. And, you know, that was the roughest thing our family went through in a very long time. But now looking at her, you know, for our family, that was the right decision. Um, but it's not the right decision for everybody.
there's studies out there. Um, uh, it, it's true. There's no way around it. Caregivers, primary caregivers, uh, put themselves under emotional and physical strain. I'm sure you all feel that. That's part of the reason why Care Compass is here. You know, we want to give you information, resources. We want you to know you're not alone uh, in your in your care journey. Um, the stress can come from, you know, just caregiving itself, problems with work, uh, family members either disagreeing with your style of care for your loved one or not stepping up. Um, your response, it's a huge burden and you don't want to call a loved one a burden, but what the burden is, is being responsible for their health and safety. That's a lot to take on for another person. You know, um, we do it for our husbands and our children and our wives, but to actually then add another person into the mix that we are ultimately responsible for it is, a, is a tough way to go. Um, I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done, but you have to find a balance so your, your life doesn't fall into disarray. Um, some people lose jobs. They have financial trouble then. Um, your household may not be able to be maintained as it once was because because you're busy caregiving. And your, your health, I know mine especially, my health was not a priority. I let a couple doctor's appointments go. I didn't order meds in a timely fashion. So uh, an ongoing condition kind of cropped up. Um, so I am actually taking steps to increase my version of self-care now that, that my mother-in-law's placed and, and that my father-in-law is moving through his path with possible placement. I wish I, wish I could have um, kept them both at home with me, but they didn't want to live with me either. So <laughs> there's that. Um, being overwhelmed and exhausted by caregiving can be alleviated through respite. Is everyone familiar with respite where you might take your loved one to a facility for a temporary stay? Or there's even uh, agencies out there that will come into your home. Sometimes it's best not to move somebody with dementia. That can be kind of uh, stressful if they're still in the home. So maybe have a, a provider come in and, and you know, and you look at, oh my goodness, that's so expensive. I just don't know. But if it creates the opportunity to continue to allow you to continue to care give, it's worth the money in my book uh, uh, and the peace of mind, knowing that mom's taken care of while I'm on vacation, uh, dad's in good hands. I don't have to worry about him slipping, falling. There's someone there to take care of that. Um, so, Oh, did somebody get their audio? Elizabeth I think I'm Hayden. good. Can you hear me? Oh, this is Beth Hayden. Yes. Okay, Thank yes. You. All right. I just saw that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, for you to be the best for your loved one in the home care setting, you know, just work hard to avoid burnout. The Area Office on Aging has a caregiver support program that can talk about respite with you. The Wood County Committee on Aging has wonderful folks who besides outside the realm of their programs will, will talk to you about, about these topics. Um, like I said, we're blessed in this community. I um, Also, I'm, I'm hoping folks who caregive at home have learned about and possibly can take advantage of palliative care that is uh, through hospice agencies. So some people don't like to get involved with that. But palliative care is just getting a nurse in there five or six weeks, every five or six weeks to monitor symptoms of your loved one through, you know, through the care journey, to be a, 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 a nurse you can call um, to say, hey, you know, a symptom's changed. What do you recommend? You know, you can either go with a doctor through their agency or you can go with 
your own doctor, um, but that's a nice support for home caregivers that's Medicare covered. And most of your hospice agencies, I know Larry's agency, you offer that, correct? The palliative care? Okay. Um, and also for home care, hospice is not the, I hate to say this, the death sentence it used to be when we put my grandmother in hospice in 1979. I actually have a client who goes in and out of hospice based on the activity of his aneurysm, you know, um, and uh, it's been a great support for him. Uh, I wish when he comes off though, unfortunately, they, you know, they take his bed and his wheelchair and his things, but when he goes back on, he gets those back, um, but it, it's really not a death sentence anymore. People have gone into hospice, weak, tired, um, sick, and just that intense care they can give in your own home to that client and the medical coordination. I've seen people actually improve and come out of hospice for a while. Um, so please don't be afraid of using those resources and those are covered by Medicare. So that's nice if you are struggling with costs of care. Um, Katie, are you ready to talk about placement? Is she here yet? Oh, there you are. Yep, yes. I'm here. Want me to go ahead and get started? Certainly. Okay. Now, can everybody hear me okay? I've been, I've been having a little trouble hearing, so everybody hears me all right? Yeah. Okay, yes. wonderful. Um, thanks. <laughs> I always want to make sure. Um, um, my name is Katie Clark, and I'm here at Brookdale and Bowling Green. I'm there. I, I hate the title, but sales manager. Um, so I talk to um, seniors in the community um, when they're thinking about possibly placing um, their loved one or even themselves. Um, I mostly talk to um, children of um, those who are thinking about needing care, um, either in the immediate future or um, in the future in general, just to gather information. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is when you are deciding on a community, what you need to um, kind of have in, in the back of your mind a little bit. Okay. And then I'll go into kind of like the community life um, um, that we have at least going on on here. So one thing we need to, um, everybody needs to keep in mind is location. So um, we have some BG years that are hardcore, you know, I don't want to live <laughs> anywhere else other than BG. Um, but then we also have people who have family that are scattered all around um, Ohio um, and the United States. So um, one key factor of deciding on a community is location. Um, do I have enough support um, where I'm at? Um, do I need to be by a loved one or a family member um, in case something were to happen? Um, so location is key. Um, right here in, in Bowling Green, we have a lot of families who live in Toledo and we have some families who live even in Finley for some of our um, for some of our residents here. So a nice central location for both of those family members to be able um, to come and visit um, or if anything, um, if there's an issue that they can come and um, visit, of course, pre-COVID. Um, COVID has thrown a wrench into a lot of um, things lately. Um, another thing to keep in mind is current care. Um, what either you or your loved one currently needs and maybe their future needs as well. So if you know, right now, um, if you're completely independent or if your loved one's completely independent, but they do have a diagnosis of, um, I'll just throw out either a dementia or Alzheimer's, you might want to find a community that's able to help with both um, or else um, um, in the future, you may have to move communities if they don't have that memory care support. Um, and another big one that, um, that um, is the big elephant in the room is cost. Um, so um, planning for the future, some people um, 
back in like the, the 80s or 90s, they had this um, long-term care insurance policy. Um, it's a good idea to go over those to make sure um, whatever community you do choose is covered and you're able to use that long-term care insurance policy to help cover your cost of care. Again, there's veteran benefits. Um, if you were a wartime vet or you were a spouse of a wartime vet, that can go towards your care. You need to meet some sort of um, activities of daily living in order uh, to get that uh, covered at your at your community um, and also home health care as well. Um, another um, big thing um, that we're seeing because of COVID um, and we're getting calls um, the last couple weeks, especially um, COVID right now is not going away. Um, everybody was just, I feel like everybody was kind of holding out, you know, I COVID, you know, I'm going to wake up in a couple weeks and everything's going to be back to normal. But unfortunately, that is just not the case. Um, so a lot of um, seniors and their families are, are calling, at, at least us, this is what we're seeing, um, you know, dad's lonely, mom's lonely. You know, they, I can't go visit like I used to, um, or I have to homeschool <laughs> my granddaughter right now um, and while their, her parents are working. So I can't give my dad or my mom the attention that, they, that I truly believe that they need and deserve. Um, so um, we even, we've always had this kind of program. Um, it's a kind of a short stay program um, and other communities have it too. You can go there for a couple weeks to try it out just to see if that community fits all your needs and getting your, your your, um, your activities of daily living met and your social needs. Um, there's a gentleman I can think of. Um, he used to go every single morning to Tim Hortons <laughs> and he would meet with his buddies and because COVID has taken that away. Um, so when I met with him, I made sure he had, he had a coffee and he was, he was all set and ready to go to make him feel more comfortable because that's something he's missing. Um, so you want to look at um, you know, activities of that community. How are they, if you were to decide to move your loved one in um, or even yourself into a community, how are they um, connecting um, the people who live in their community with their family and with the other residents in the community? So um, again, COVID throwing a lot of wrench, wrenches into that. Um, we had to adjust our, our activities here. So um, for the most part, um, we have done countless FaceTimes with family members. And, um, you know, we aren't having families come into the community to visit, um, but we are also seeing um, family members who live across the United States that are able to talk to mom and dad more often than they ever have been and see them because of um, the technology that, um, that we have. So we have FaceTime or Zoom. So they're able to do this and talk. There's a gentleman that talks to both of his daughters every single day at 3.30 without fail. <laughs> so um, now um, it's changed a little bit because now we're starting to do outdoor visits, okay? We're able to do smaller group activities, social distancing and everything. So if you think about it, um, your, your loved one um, not being able to um, get out like they used to because they're afraid of catching, of catching COVID. Um, so, um, you know, the, the Tim Hortons was taken away from the gentleman I was telling you about. You know, the senior center. Oh, my gosh. So many people I've talked to have, like, I miss playing cards or I miss, I miss doing all this. And I've been trying to get them as I'm talking to them connected into these type of Zoom um, activities so they can stay connected through all this until um, any of the, the senior communities are able to open again like that's just uh, the senior center just does an amazing job and they truly miss that so i'm trying to get them connected um that way until all of this kind of um starts to calm down whenever whenever that is um and um i love it when i lost my place in my notes <laughs> so um um when you do end up joining a community you know there's five or six different departments that um, are setting eyes on your loved one, um, even if they don't need um, any care. Um, here in the community, we have, we have maintenance. So we have, uh, we have a maintenance uh, guy, his name's Joe, and we have um, our housekeeper. Um, they're in and out of rooms all the time, um, not just on the days that they're scheduled, but maybe there was a spill and they're in there again. Again, more eyes um, caring for and looking over your loved one. Um, nursing, um, uh, of course, care, that's a big thing. Making sure medications are on time, making sure um, that there maybe needs to be an adjustment with medications. Um, just an extra pair of eyes and someone who understands that category. Um, and then um, we have our dietary team who um, make sure that we all of our residents have nutritious meals. Um, 
some, you know, no sugar added, that sort of thing, fresh fruit, uh, made from scratch meals, um, and, and to have a variety too, instead of the same thing, either all the time, or maybe just one choice, um, several different, different choices, and again, an extra pair of eyes, we're noticing they're not drinking as much, you know, fluids as they used to, or they're not, they're only eating half their plate now, and we use our nursing team um, um, to kind of figure out what, what's going on there. Um, and then activities, again, big one. Um, keeping in touch with families, keeping in touch with each other. Um, here, um, here in our community, we have two courtyards. So our residents have been able to go outside and get fresh air and the sunshine, even though we're, you know, we're supposed to stay um, here in our community. Everything is enclosed. Um, our residents used to love sitting out front and look and watching all the traffic and seeing everybody go in and out of the Sunday station. Um, but we can't, we can't do that right now um, just because of COVID. So our, um, our internal um, courtyards, including our memory care has an enclosed courtyard. They've been able to get outside and get some fresh air and go on walks and they're still able to take their pets through there um, so it just it just kind of depends um, we're also seeing that people are waiting too long caregivers are waiting too long to ask for help and I'm not necessarily saying I'm moving to a community I'm just saying asking for help in general there's so many people anybody that's on here um, the senior center I have to scroll through you know Beth bolts with golden care partners we have um, Ohio Living and we have Oasis. There are so many resources just right here alone um, that you are more than welcome to reach out to and we can ask, you can ask any questions you want. You know, this is, um, this is my going on 10 years of being in the um, senior care, not only just senior living, senior care. I started out in home health care um, and I've done activities um, for five and a half years at a different community and now I'm the sales manager. So you have a lot of um, people who are very educated and on what to help. That's really the basis and that's why we're in um, the job that we're in. We just wanna help people. Um, so there's there's people that either live too far away, I'll follow up with them in the next week to make sure, you know, did they, were they able to reach out and did they get some assistance and uh, the contact information I gave them, did it work out? Um, but one thing about um, community is just peace of mind. And I think Beth also harped on that. Um, a little bit as well. It's just, there is someone looking over and caring for your loved one 24 seven without fail. Um, there's, you know, we have several um, um, caregivers here in our community. Um, there's always, um, there's your, their, your caregiver or your loved one is never really truly alone. Um, they just need to pull their call light um, or even just peek out the door and they'll see, they'll see um, either other residents or staff members right away. Um, I will say a little bit with the waiting too long, um, my grandma, <laughs> bless her heart, she lived, um, she took care of her husband until she couldn't care for him anymore. And um, my grandma has always been a caregiver, never had a job. She was a domestic goddess, we'll just say that. Um, and uh, my grandma passed away about 12 years ago and she stated she was fine being alone. My aunt would go over every day after work, make sure the trash was taken out and that she got her mail. Um, and um, that was really the only interaction she had, but oh sure, she could tell you every soap opera and every Hallmark movie and all the celebrities, <laughs> what's going on in their lives. But that was like her only means of communication for the most part. We'd call her when we could, we'd check on her when we could, even though we lived in town, you know, everybody thought everybody else was, you know, taking care of grandma. And really it was just the one daughter. Um, grandma started having some health issues. Um, and so we really didn't know how bad they were. Um, she had, this was all during COVID. So only one family member could go into the hospital and be with her at a time. Um, it found out she had cancer and it was everywhere. Um, you know, if there was, you know, there's always the what if, you know, if there was a couple more eyes on grandma, maybe they would have noticed these changes and we could have gotten her help sooner or we could have detected it sooner. I um, mean, she'd still be here, but um, she was stubborn and did not want, did not want to leave her home. Um, and she uh, lived in a community for just about a month. Um, and then she, she did end up passing. It was just, you know, just that extra set of eyes, you, you know, you just, you never know what could have happened or what if. She would have, she loved it. The first couple of weeks that she was there, um, she absolutely loved it. She, <laughs> she was like, I've never had this much attention um, ever in my life. Um, and she loved people coming in and out, checking on her, making sure she had everything. And for the first time she, you know, she was being taken care of because her whole entire life and even for her husband, she was caring for others. Um, so, and it's a very hard decision um, being um, doing what I do. It's very rare that a senior's like 
I'm ready to move into a community. I'm ready to leave my home that I help raise my children in and my grand my grandkids come over and visit. It, it's not an easy decision, um, but as um, for the caregivers, that's when, you know, reaching out for resources and help, um, asking questions, getting a plan in place. That is huge. Um, there has been several instances where um, someone fell and they don't qualify to get Medicare paid stay at a skilled community and they're just going to send their loved one home. Luckily, you know, there's respite programs that can help out short term stays, get them more independent or used to um, are used to what is going on with them um, after a hospital stay or um, they're not being able to be as independent um, as they once were. Um, and then and then being able to eventually go back into their home, you know, senior living doesn't have to be a forever thing, you know, we'd love to help you out as long, long as possible, but it, it doesn't have to be it can be short, short stays, just uh, um, maybe family has to go on vacation, um, or we and they need a, a couple week to a 30 day stay just depending um, those resources are out there and there's communities that will do that. Um, so we are here to help and all you gotta. All you got to do is ask. Um, again, there's several people here that would love to talk to you and, and talk you um, through um, whatever you're, you're dealing with and whatever you need help with and what questions you have. So again, it's just, um, it's just a peace of mind is really um, what it all boils down to. <laughs> I was in the car thinking of what I was going to say, so I apologize if I, I went a little fast. Um, it's a little bit more time. Is there any any other topics or anything I can I can speak on about or anything a little bit more before we hand it over to Oasis? Perfect, Katie. And if anyone has a question, they can place it in the chat feature, and we'd be happy to answer. Um, any questions for Beth or Katie? Well, I really do appreciate both of you sharing this valuable information. And I, I think you made both made the greatest point ever is that we're very fortunate in Wood County to have a lot of feeder programs that are able to work together and really take people on the journey of caregiving and follow them all the way through towards the end of the journey. And I think that that's truly important to realize that there are a lot of support systems out there and I think it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to seek information to prepare and plan. And you actually point of saying, um, you have to have a plan in place. Like mm -hmm. anything in life, when you're planning to go off to school and take a course, you have to have a vision, you have to know where you're going. And I think with caregiving, you can take it day by day, but to have that plan in place eases the burden tremendously. And I appreciate all of you guys to having that support system for these caregivers. Um, we will okay. take it on and move forward. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I will go say ahead. another thing real quick is um, word, word of mouth. Like if you or know someone who's a little intimidated um, to talk to maybe, you know, one of us or someone in a specific community, they want to get more of like a general idea of what they should do. Um, anything in your um, social groups, your churches, people you know who already have a loved one either in a community or already mm -hmm. with another home health care individual. Um, everybody knows someone who is, is either already placed or at home that is getting care. So just ask around um, and that's really where you're gonna get your truest answers from and, and, and what your next step or what community or what home health care agency uh, to use. So personal experiences, that's another, another key factor there. Katie, may I ask a question? I know I said no, but um, I have my husband that I'm taking care of, and I'm, I currently have Ohio Living that comes in and assists me in the house to help me with uh, his needs. Um, and if I have to move him, my intention is to keep him at home as long as possible. Um, when I have to move him into a memory care, can they continue to, to um, you know, to take care of him? The nurses come in and they take care of him now, but would that continue if I move him into a memory care or do you take it over? Do you? Yeah. Um, so it depends on where you move him. If you move him to a memory care that's in an assisted living, 
uh, like what Catherine has at her facility, um, then Ohio Living can still come in and provide services. Um, if they're providing therapy, um, they can still come in and provide that uh, at a place like Brookdale. Um, if you were to take them to more of a long-term care facility, a traditional nursing home, then they will fully take over the care then. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, great questions. So thank you both to Catherine and Beth. And if you do have any questions, um, sometimes questions come up in your mind as you're listening to something else, feel free to add those to the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, but at this time, we're gonna go ahead and introduce our next speaker. And we have Len Knorr from Oasis Senior Care Advisors. And the topic he's gonna share on today is it's okay to place your loved one. So um, please welcome Len. Great. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well. It's a genuine privilege to be able to do this. Um, let me first introduce, uh, it's going to be me and my wife on why we're, what I'm going to hope is qualified to chat with you today. Um, my name is Len Kiner. Uh, I'm from Toledo. Uh, I actually began my career at St. John's High School. So I was a teacher and then I became the principal for discipline and attendance, um, which was perhaps the worst job I ever had. But that, that's another story and another PowerPoint. Um, I then became um, a consultant and manager director at a company called Root or Root Learning, uh, which started in Perrysburg and is in now in Sylvania. My wife is Missy. She hails from the Old Fort area, uh, and she's been a nurse for 35 years. She ran the emergency department at St. Vincent. She actually established um, the uh, memory care unit, uh, I'm sorry, the hospice unit uh, that is now at the Heritage in BG. Um, with uh, Blanche, when she was with Blanchard Valley. She's been a care navigator with ProMedica. She carries a variety of different uh, qualifications from official uh, certified dementia planner to uh, critical care transition coordinator as well. So she has lots and lots of experience. I also wanna introduce you to my mom. This is Mary Ann. Um, she's a wonderful woman and in 2015, my mom was driving and was T-boned at the intersection of Secor and Sylvania in Toledo and broke her neck. Uh, for a year or so, Missy had been telling me that your mom has the beginnings of dementia. I'm concerned about your mom. She's had some tea kettles boil over and she doesn't take them off. Her clothes are singed here and there. Um, and I, as a son, really didn't want to have to deal with that. Um, I was sure my mom would be okay because she's always been okay. And, you know, it would hurt her uh, to even begin to have that conversation. Well, with a broken neck, there was no chance for a conversation. Uh, she was not going to be able to go back home. Um, she recovered fully, but she had to go into an assisted living. Um, quite honestly, there were lots of assisted livings in Toledo. They're all the same. Um, so we just happened to pick one that was close to my sister. Uh, it turned out to be perhaps one of the worst moves we've ever made. And for two years, we kept trying to correct that. Um, it wasn't a good culture fit. My mother uh, was more of a blue jeans and flannel shirt person who liked to sort of roll up her sleeves and work. The community we placed her in had um, some of the women wearing pearls and cashmere sweaters. In a way, it almost became like high school all over again uh, for my mom, which is unfortunate. Uh, we had some mediocre care. We actually brought in an agency. And over the course of three years or so, she, um, she moved three different times. And it's because we never really did our homework. Um, we had just assumed everything was the same. While that was going on, father-in-law, or Missy's dad, Pete, uh, fell off his back porch and hyperextended his vertebrae. He was paralyzed from the waist up. The waist down, he was paralyzed from the waist up. And we now had to find him entirely different set 
of circumstances where he could be taken care Hello? of. Hello? 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 Hi, Ginger. Uh, oh, hi. Okay, I'll back on Can you. you hear us Sorry, okay, I was trying to change phones. Sorry. Okay. Okay, um, Glenn, if you're able to speak a little louder, we're having trouble hearing you. Oh, sure. Uh, is this better? Yes. Okay. That's great. way better. I'm sorry about that. I do have some issues with Zoom. Um, and so break in if you can't hear me. So, um, so we now had to find a place for my father-in-law to live. Uh, both of them passed away in 2017. Pete passed away in January of 2017. And my mom passed away in July of 2017. And what ended up happening is Missy and I were talking and we said, you know, we've really acquired a lot of information about insurance and places where people can live and what the alternatives are. Can't we do something with that knowledge? And so uh, three years ago yesterday, we actually opened our business, Oasis Senior Advisors. Uh, we are a free service to senior citizens and their families looking for assisted living, independent living and memory care. Um, and our goal was to really take this last step in our career and do something to help people. So with that being said, here are really my goals today. Uh, I really wanna help you understand that it's okay to move your loved one to a new home. Um, and, and, and we'll actually get in that. Um, I want you to be able to empathize with your loved one and understand the emotions that they're actually going through. And I want you to recognize that there's a variety of different living options that meet multiple needs. Long ago, we used to think of nursing homes and it sort of conjured this awful image in our mind. Here, you know, you go to a Brookdale, you go to a Swan Creek, you go to many of them, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, it isn't what people tend to think of. And then ultimately what we're going to do is we're going to provide you the strategies that we share with, our, with uh, the people that we help as you really begin to go on this journey. There will be a bit of overlap with uh, some of the things that Katie shared, but hopefully that's good repetition. Uh, since I don't have access to the chat, I really wanted to ask people, why do you think people struggle with moving their loved ones to a new home? Uh, we're, we're just going to sort of share it with you. But uh, Beth had mentioned several of them. Uh, there's this guilt that, oh my goodness, I'm going to put them away um, and they'll never see the light of day again. Um, maybe there was a promise made at a much earlier time under very different circumstances that we would never move you, that you'll always be home. And you very well might find that those same circumstances don't exist. Um, you're waiting for a clear cut sign that they can no longer live alone. For me, it was my mother breaking her neck in a car accident. What would have been a worse scenario is if she would have killed someone else or someone else got injured. Luckily, that wasn't the case, but it certainly could have been. And it was a thing that I had ignored. Um, the concern that your parents won't be happy or that they're going to come to it on their own conclusion. Much like Katie said, I've never seen anyone do a cartwheel over the fact that they're going to be able to go to assisted living um, because it is different and it's often a fear of the unknown. But what we want to do is we want to begin to think about what's going on in their mind. So what do you think as you think of uh, a, a spouse or a parent. What are they thinking of? Uh, Missy and I are both certified senior care advisors and there's a society that we've been educated under. The four most common concerns of older adults, and this really shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, is this loss of independence that, you know, once I leave my house, I'm not going to be independent anymore. And that isn't true. Uh, you can certainly still go to a community and still very much be independent, and it actually encourages your independence. But we have to understand that that's a concern. Um, people are faced with their own mortality, and what's the legacy that they're going to leave behind? Um, lack of financial resources. Do I have enough? It's really very expensive. Um, how am I going to afford that? And ultimately, the biggest fear is dementia. 
um, that I'm not going to have my memories from the past. I also believe when it came to my mom, my, my busha uh, was actually placed in a nursing home because she was no longer able to live at her own house. And this was in the 70s. And it goes back to people being put in jerry chairs uh, and sitting in hallways. And no one wants that in the end of their life. And so it's really trying to help people understand what are the op options out there. So in case you're not familiar, what I'm going to do is I'm going to really give you an, a sense of the core four. Um, we can also talk about CCRCs or hospice care or more like a home assisted living, but they're all variations of this exact, of these four same models. Um, when I talk about independent living, I'm really talking about um, not like a 55 plus apartment, which is still, you're entirely on your own. In independent living communities, and you could, and there are some that are assisted living and independent living, um, it's a good solution for people who can no longer be at home. Um, as Katie had said, you know, there's multiple eyes on people to check on them. Uh, meals can be provided, laundry, housekeeping, transportation activities are all there. We're talking about multi-housing and it very much feels like an apartment. So there's a kitchenette, a bathroom. Um, there could be a studio or even a one bedroom. So I still have this sense of independence, but maybe some of my meals are being provided or someone's helping me with transportation. And if I need some care intermittently, there's usually a third party available to provide that through a hospital or a home care agency as they go through. This would be what we would simply call independent living. For the most part, I'm still functioning, but you know, I need other, I, I need maybe a bit of socialization or other people around. When we talk about assisted living, um, again, it's a combination of housing and personalized supportive services and healthcare. So you still get those personal needs met of meals, laundry, housekeeping, transportation, activities. But then I can also get assistance with eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, movement, med management, emergency call system. Um, some places will offer different levels of care and some assisted living communities are what you call all inclusive. Everyone's going to pay $4,000 and whatever care you need, you're going to get it. Other people are evaluated and if you need three of these services, um, you're going to be at a level one. If you need five of these services, it's a level two. So each of them are very different. But again, still offer activity, socialization. There's then memory care, which is very much dedicated to dementia care, or Alzheimer's care. Um, people who have dementia or Alzheimer's, and I believe Katie can attest to this as well, um, can still live in assisted living, providing they're not a flight risk, they're not a, of harm to themselves, they're not a harm to other people. Uh, we've had several assisted living communities where they'll say, People are just sort of pleasantly confused, but they're, they're not going to flee. Oftentimes, memory cares have smaller rooms, probably not a private bath, and it's often secured. So you have a passcode to get in and out. People, the doors are alarmed, so they need to very closely monitor people. And then finally, you have skilled nursing. Um, this is a state licensed facility where it's nursing care provided 24 hours for skilled who have multiple needs. Um, you can get private or semi-private rooms. A semi-private room is simply going to be a curtain separating you. Uh, it'll take care of your personal care. It'll take uh, care of your nursing care and typically admitted by a physician or medical facility. This is a skilled nursing home or nursing home in that traditional sense. When we talk about the benefits of placing, and people really need to understand this as people struggle with, 
oh my goodness, I can't do this to my parents. When you do this and they're no longer living independently, there's a sense of physical safety. Uh, the building and the surroundings, it's secure. Um, it, it's a bathroom that is ready to accommodate an older person. Perhaps the floors are softer floors so that should there be a fall, they're not going to break a hip or a bone. Um, there's also that sense of personal safety that Katie had talked about, multiple touch points with the staff. People have multiple eyes on them and they can begin to notice they're not eating, they're not showing up for activity. Good nutrition. Um, really a huge idea, a, a huge component. When I get that proper nutrition, I think better, I can function better. I get that proper care. I no longer have to worry about the fact that I'm soiling myself, but rather I have someone who can help me with my toileting needs, and I don't have to be embarrassed about it with my children. But I think the biggest thing is socialization. There have been a ton of studies done in that elderly people living by themselves can be as devastating as smoking a certain number of cigarettes a day. It has that negative impact on them when they are isolated. And even given the situation now, I can't even really socialize the way I used to. That has to be devastating. And it takes a real, um, it, it takes a real toll on the body as well as the spirit. We just simply like to say, well, it might seem like a loss of independence. ILs and ALs, so independent living and assisted living really preserve that independence by providing help with essential daily tasks. And I don't have to worry about it anymore and I can move on with my life. With OASIS, we always really profile people in terms of four qualities. So as we interview them and really help them begin to figure out what I wanna do or where I should go, we ask them about what is the care that they need. You know, can the community dispense medication? Who's dispensing the medication? In Michigan, it doesn't have to be a nurse. Uh, so the licensures really are very different. Uh, can the community assist with bathing, continent, incontinence issues? Uh, can they assist with a one-person transfer or a two-person transfer? That a lot of times will decide whether you can go to like an assisted living community or if you have to go to a nursing home. If it's a one-person transfer, most assisted livings do that. Not all assisted livings do a two-person transfer, and very few even do a Hoyer lift anymore for people who can't get out of bed. Um, can the community assist with feeding? Um, can mom or dad age in place? As, as it's been mentioned by both Beth and Katie, a lot of times you don't want to move them more than once. So can I stay there forever? Culture is another aspect that I really missed with my parents. And, and our goal here is it's okay to place your mom or dad or your loved one if you really consider the right things. So the type of care they're going to consider, but also consider the culture that you want. You know, is it more of a quiet community or is there always something going on? How do they go about encouraging socialization? How do they get people really to get to know one another? What would the first week look like? Is there a buddy system in place? What's the diversity of the community? And I'm not necessarily speaking ethnicity, but what are the backgrounds? What were the occupations of people, even politics? That can really determine what the right, what the right community might be for me. I had shared, um, we ended up just picking a community based on where my sister lived. That was wrong. My mom wanted to work. My mom wanted to help people. She wanted to be able to um, do tasks that contributed to the good of the community. She didn't want to be waited on. Um, and so we actually ended up picking the wrong community for her. And we should have done our homework. When you consider these things, you're really making the best, the best, um, 
the best decision for your for your parents for your loved one in really ensuring that the care they need the culture is appropriate you also have to consider financials so katie had talked about this beth had talked about it independent living assisted living memory care are typically private pay you're on the hook for that um, is there a long-term care um, funding are there va benefits um, there might be some communities there are a few out there that accept a medicaid waiver where and you can still live in assisted living um, medicaid covers a SNP, some of which have secured units for dementia or alzheimer's patients but you have to have a sense of the financials and finally geography um, the geography is really interesting because oftentimes we find people want to be near mom and dad in case there's an emergency oftentimes we would rather them place at a at an organization or a community that's the right culture and be 20 minutes away because there are people there who can take care of the emergent needs um so a lot of times we will get people who say, you know, I've lived in BG all my life. I have to remain in BG. Oftentimes, you know, will, will they really receive visitors? Are they going to go out into the community? I'm not trying to discount it, but I would prefer to have the right culture fit, the right care fit, as opposed to necessarily the right geographical fit. It, it's a consideration, but not necessarily the most important in our Um, we want to give you some strategies for evaluating committee, uh, communities as well. We actually give our clients a four-page checklist that they can consider as they go through, and I just wanted to share some with you. So as you look at a community, you know, do you see residents gathered in common areas or are they all in their own rooms? Uh, do the staff know the residents by name? Uh, do the residents appear to be happy? In terms of safety, you should really be considering, you know, are the doors secured in the evening? There are some where they are not locked. Um, is there an emergency pendant or an emergency pull cord in the rooms? And what's the procedure for a medical emergency should your mom or dad pull the cord? Does it go to 911? Does it go to the front desk? These are things that you need to begin to consider. And again, we offer these to you so that you don't have to really be panged with guilt, but you're finding the ideal place for your, for your parents. Uh, let's talk about the staff. You know, how many hours are a nurse there? Not everyone who takes, does the direct patient care is actually a nurse. That's a misconception. Um, are the, is there a nurse on staff 24 hours a day, eight hours a day? Um, you know, do you do background checks on your employees? What's the staff to resident ratio? And really when you're talking about that and they include the executive director, how often does the executive director spend with the residents? Uh, we wanna know the number of people who actually deal with the residents. And then ultimately the tenure of the staff. It's awesome that the activities director has been there for 15 years. How about the people that are actually doing the direct care? all good questions to ask to make sure mom and dad get the type of care that they need. Other things around food and nutrition. Um, you know, how many meals are provided? Do you accommodate special diets? Will you take requests? Um, activities, is there a direct activities director on staff? Uh, can we see a calendar of the events? Um, and you know, how do you go about actually promoting socialization? And then ultimately you want to also ask about fine print. Um, you know, is there a community fee? If we only stay a month, is the community fee refundable? Is there a long-term lease or are we going month to month? What are their extra fees for? All things for you to consider as, as you begin to evaluate the right place to stay. These are all very important questions. Um, and if you aren't going to be wrecked with guilt, you need to know that you made the very best decision for mom and dad. But let's actually do our vetting. Let, let's ask some good questions. Um, change is hard and, and no one likes it. And, and while it would be wonderful 
to be able to keep mom and dad at home for as long as they could. Sometimes that's not the safe option. Sometimes it doesn't work for the family. Um, and it's really interesting. Katie had mentioned this. Uh, you have to begin the conversation and don't expect, expect it to be wrapped up in 15 minutes. This is an emotional issue. This isn't a logical one. And what's even better, begin the conversation before you absolutely have to. Katie talked about the plan. We advocate for a plan as well. Let's have a plan in place. Should something happen, that becomes an easier conversation to have when we don't necessarily need to. But if we do, remember, this is, this is a marathon. This isn't a sprint. This isn't going to be over with in one conversation. <clears throat> Approach the topic by focusing on concerns for their safety. Stick to the facts and just the facts. Um, I've noticed that the food in the refrigerator is rotten or there isn't any food in the refrigerator. Do you have scent marks on the drawer? Um, you know, the, there's a bit of an odor. Why aren't you sleeping in your bed? Why are you sleeping downstairs? And then really begin discussing options, sort of like a brainstorming session. All options are good, even if you know that that can't happen, just to get the options out there really begins giving them a sense of ownership. I'm helping to make the choice in my journey. You know, you're not telling me what to do. I'm actually a partner in this. We're working on this together. And you got to see it through their eyes. Be patient. Um, and then when and if they do move to a community, don't expect things to go smoothly right away. Um, it just takes time. And I know that Katie can attest to that. Um, and just to wrap it up, and I, I want to be very cognizant of people's time, a few final points. It's okay to place your loved one. It's a, it's a practical and an emotional issue. Empathize with mom or dad, but safety and security really should be paramount in the decision. Gone are the days that the only option was a nursing home. There are a variety of different communities that offer vibrant lifestyles and encourage socialization and independence. Um, so you're not putting them away. They're just moving into the next phase, into a new home. They can still remain independent if that's in their mindset. Uh, if you want your loved ones to be happy, consider what they value from a culture perspective, what they can afford from a financial perspective, and what they need from a care perspective all three important considerations. Not all communities are equal or the same. Know what's important for your loved one, be prepared with questions, and do the investigation. Go in and, and make sure that you can find the right one for them. And finally, don't be afraid to have the conversation. It's not going to be easy and it's not going to be fast. But if you come at it with good intentions, everything's going to work. So that was also really fast. Hopefully you gleaned a bit of information. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, see if there's any questions. I have a question. Um, I'm just curious, do you help for, um, someone came to my door in the middle, I'm sorry, and I oh, missed sorry. a little bit of what you were saying, but did you, um, mentioned, do is yours only for um, these uh, longer term placement, or do you help us with, you know, like a respite care, short term, or even day to day placement things, you know, for people coming into our homes, or just for looking for daycare uh, so facilities? We can help with anything, and much like uh, Katie had said, several of the resources on the call today can help you in that uh, with any of that. So we do the assisted living, independent living and memory care, but we can also advise on nursing homes. We can also help with uh, home care or if I want someone like a, a Golden Care Partners. I mean, there's a variety of different things we can help with. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. And do you have a phone number or something that uh, you can reach out to the Wood County and, and they'll share it. Yeah. So oh, okay. Yeah. So just reach out to us at the Wood County Committee on Aging and we can provide that information. Great. Thank you. 
am I still sharing? So it didn't pop up on as a screen share. Yeah, so did I stop sharing? I Your screen share never did pop up. Oh, you're kidding. No, yeah. I had all of this in a PowerPoint with all that information. So what we can do is we can offer, if you email it to me, then we can work on that. Oh Share. my God, I am so sorry. Okay, no worries. Oh God, you had to look at me. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out, you did a great job. Yeah, it was so, excellent. Yes, at this time, I'd like to open it up. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording and really wanna thank all of our um, great speakers today for the Care Compass project. And following uh, the stopping of the recording, we'll have an opportunity to ask any additional questions.